Near the end of the last video, we talked about physical equilibrium and the idea that for any system in equilibrium and any pair of processes, forward and reverse, the important thing to keep in mind is that the rate of the forward process is equal to the rate of the reverse process at equilibrium, such that we do not notice any macroscopic change in the system, even though microscopic change is still occurring. Importantly, notice that this equation only says that the two rates must be equal, not that they must be zero. And almost always, in fact, for our purposes, always, the forward and reverse rates will be equal to each other, but will both be non-zero. So for example, when a vapor and a liquid are in equilibrium, condensation and evaporation are always occurring, even in an equilibrium state, when the moles of gas and the moles of liquid appear not to be changing. That's an important concept that I want to lay out before we get into the details of vapor-liquid -li equilibrium. Now, let's think about everyday life for a second and the idea that if we leave, for example, a glass of water out on a table in an open container, the water will spontaneously evaporate from the container and will eventually all turn to gas. On the microscopic level, what's going on? Well, molecules near the surface of the li liquid are escaping into the gas phase. It's worth asking the question, why is this process spontaneous? We know from a thermodynamic perspective that it must have delta G less than zero. Evaporation must somehow have delta G less than zero. And one way to think about this, actually, is as the liquid as a kind of very confined or compressed or condensed ideal gas, and the gas itself as a much more spread out gas with much higher volume. Just based on this simple perspective, what we're doing upon evaporating is expanding the liquid gas, quote unquote, into essentially infinite volume because the resulting gas molecules have the entire atmosphere of planet Earth to roam, essentially. So the change in entropy there is very, very large. And if we neglect the influence of enthalpy, delta G has got to be less than zero for this evaporation process. The idea is that delta S is far, far greater than zero for evaporation. And if we think of this as expansion of an ideal gas, it should be clear why that's the case. Here are a couple of equations to remind us of the idea. We saw that for an ideal gas expanding from V1 to V2, the entropy change is proportional to the natural log of V2 over V1. So if V2 is very large, as it is when a liquid is sitting in an open container such that the gas molecules can fill, say, the entire volume of a room, then delta S is going to be very large and very positive, and delta G is going to end up being very negative. That is, the process will be spontaneous. What happens when we take that liquid, say that glass of water, and pour it into a closed container like a thermos? Well, in a closed container, empirically what we'll notice is that some liquid remains even after very long times. However, there's something interesting that happens in the head space above the liquid. If we put a pressure gauge in that empty space above the surface of the liquid, we'll notice that the gas that evaporates from the surface of the liquid actually exerts a pressure. The pressure in the head space above the liquid is greater than atmospheric pressure, and that's due, of course, to the gas molecules that have formed from evaporation from the liquid surface. This pressure that comes from collisions of the gas molecules that were formerly liquid with the walls of the container is called vapor pressure. And for physical equilibrium, this is really the foundational concept, I would say. The idea that the gas molecules of an evaporating liquid exert a pressure on the walls of a closed container. Note, however, that molecules are still constantly evaporating up and condensing back down onto the surface of the liquid. Once the vapor pressure is constant, we know we're in a state of equilibrium. Because the pressure is unchanging with time, the temperature is unchanging with time, and all other state variables we would find are unchanging with time when the vapor pressure becomes a constant. At this point, the rates of vaporization and the rates of condensation are equal to one another. This is the idea we just talked about. Let's think about what happens when we increase the volume of the headspace above the liquid. What this will do is give us insight to the question of how do we know that vaporization and condensation are always occurring? How do we know from the previous slide that the two rates are equal and they're both non-zero? That is, how do we know that evaporation hasn't ceased completely or condensation hasn't ceased completely? Consider a closed system containing water and water vapor in equilibrium at constant temperature. 
What happens when we rapidly increase the volume of the headspace? What happens when we take, for example, our container with some water in the bottom and some gas molecules above, and we very rapidly and irreversibly, if you like, increase the volume of that headspace by maybe pulling up a piston or plunger on a syringe or, or something like that. Well, instantaneously, the vapor doesn't know that that expansion has occurred. And so if our pressure gauge is up here, the vapor pressure decreases rapidly upon this expansion. If we were to plot, for example, the vapor pressure over time, initially with the system in a state of equilibrium, the vapor pressure would be at some level. Upon doing the volume change, we'd get a rapid drop in the vapor pressure but over time, actually, the vapor pressure slowly rises back to the equilibrium vapor pressure. And then once it reaches it, it stays at that equilibrium vapor pressure for all time. That tells us that the vapor pressure at the equilibrium state is independent of the headspace volume. Eventually, once the system returns to equilibrium, PVAP returns to the level that it was at in the original equilibrium state. So immediately after the volume increase, the system is out of equilibrium. You'll see figures like this quite often, where rapid change is indicated by a big spike up or down in the value of some state function. This state right here is a non-equilibrium state. As the system returns to equilibrium, macroscopic processes happen, spontaneous processes happen. And one important thing to understand is that at this point, the rate of vaporization, the rate of evaporation, is not equal to the rate of condensation. In fact, in this case, since we increased the volume, the rate of vaporization becomes much greater than the rate of condensation. So molecules vaporize spontaneously to increase the moles of gas until the equilibrium vapor pressure is reestablished. Let's take another look at the figure to see how this works. When the volume is expanded, the gas molecules will spontaneously fill the resulting volume of the container. And so at that moment, actually, there are fewer gas molecules moving down toward the surface of the liquid than there are expanding into the now empty space created by the rapid volume increase. That causes a decrease in the rate of condensation. That causes the rate of condensation to go down. The rate of vaporization is probably still about the same, since the surface of the liquid, in a sense, has no idea that the volume of its headspace has increased. As a result, the rate of vaporization is greater than the rate of condensation at the moment instantaneously after the volume increase has taken place. Consequently, vaporization will occur on a macroscopic level, that is, bulk evaporation will take place until the vapor pressure is reestablished, until we get enough moles of gas in the headspace to reestablish the vapor pressure. What's the effect of increasing temperature on the vapor pressure of a liquid? Well, let's imagine our system of liquid water with some of its vapor in equilibrium in the headspace. What's going to happen to the vapor pressure as temperature increases? Well, one thing to recognize right off the bat is that if we treat this as ideal, then clearly PVAP should increase with temperature, right? This is just an incarnation of the ideal gas law with the number of moles of gas and the volume held constant. If the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases. But notice, according to the ideal gas law, this should be a linear relationship. And in fact, what we observe in practice, if you pay attention to this graph on the left, is a much more rapid than linear increase in the vapor pressure with temperature. So the corresponding lines predicted by the ideal gas law are much less dramatic than the increases observed in practice. Why is this? Well, it has something to do with the number of moles of gas. We've assumed here that the number of moles of vapor is constant, but with increasing temperature, it's not necessarily the case that the number of moles of gas will be constant. So an increase in temperature evidently then must cause an increase in the number of moles of vapor molecules. Why is this? We can answer this question by thinking about how free energy applies to vapor-liquid equilibrium, and we're going to do that in the next video.